Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Catalyst Energies. My name is Dee. Thank you for joining me. I am so grateful that you are here. Welcome back, everyone, and welcome to this full moon forecast. We're having a full moon in Taurus, as you can see on the screen in front of you, if in fact you are watching this video. Full moon in Taurus. It will be conjunct the planet Uranus. It will be conjunct the Seven Sisters or the Pleiades. And we're going to talk about the main astrological themes for the next two weeks. So the last half or the second half of the lunar cycle from full moon to our next new moon, which will be on the 1st of December. It will be in the zodiac sign of Sagittarius. It will be in a conjunction with the star Antares. So there's actually quite a bit of galactic energy coming into um, the lunar cycles, uh, this one, and certainly the next one. So we're going to have a conversation about that as well. So a couple of announcements. There's some big changes. I will keep it as brief as possible. It's really not going to change anything on this channel in particular, but it's important to share what is changing about Catalyst Energies and where things are going. Uh, talk a little bit about the solar weather that is current and some of my thoughts and opinions about what may be happening dovetail into my conversation or message for the Pleiadian star seeds because that's really wrapped up in this full moon and, and of course with Uranus sitting so close to the Pleiades and continues to do so because Uranus moves very slowly in relation to us. There's, there's just some aspects that I want to either remind us about. When I say us, it's because I have the Pleiadian uh, markings in my chart as well. Maybe give a little overview if you're new to this whole starseed thing, how I come to designate or read for these starseed positions. And then we'll get into the astrology. So uh, let's just get right into it. So the announcements, there's, you know, there's big change everywhere. That's uh, no secret. And for me personally and for Catalyst Energies, it became clear. And there have been many times where I've wanted to either give up or stop doing this. And I've always gotten the, the pushback or the resistance from spirits like, no, keep going. Well, this is the first time uh, since I started Catalyst as this channel, right? Because Catalyst Energies has been a number of different things and will continue to hold the space for my practice as it also uh, evolves and grows, right? So this is the first time in the, in the last month or so where I have um, did not get that resistance, that pushback. It was spirits like, okay, it is time now to make changes. So um, one of the changes is that I'm discontinuing my subscriber content, so there'll no longer be a link to Subscribestar. Um, those folks have already been informed, so that's not anything new to them. So, and that affects nothing on this channel. Um, in fact, nothing really is gonna change if you're watching this video on whatever channel you're on because I'm going to continue doing the new moon and full moon forecast. This is truly a labor of love for me and I wanna continue that. I will still be offering readings and energy work sessions um, distance wise. My website is still very active. You can still book through my website um, and there are a lot of options there in terms of services. And of course, if you're interested in something that it's not really there. There's always the opportunity to do something custom and do billable hours. So uh, somebody had actually, one of my subscribers and a very long time friend, I was uh, working with this person and offering insight and doing a little bit of uh, counseling and coaching. And she actually had said like, you, you would be an amazing life coach. So I don't know if I'd necessarily want to call myself that um, as a life coach, but that is maybe a service that I would offer as uh, on a rolling basis. So that's, that's down the road, right? I'm definitely reorienting my focus to in-person, uh, hands-on, uh, in the trenches work, um, in, in terms of my practice, right? I'm going to be stepping things up in terms of the body work and cranial sacral and energy work um, in person. And so it's just time to step away from um, putting as much focus on the digital platform. But of course, if you're here, you're watching this video, you're still going to get the new moon and full moon forecast. Like I said, it's a labor of love. It's my offering. So don't worry. The only change that's going to happen on this front is that I'm going to cut the Odyssey channel. So uh, to Tinfoil Hatter, you're going to have to get on to Rumble or BitChute if you want to keep watching videos. So otherwise, Rumble, BitChute, YouTube, you're still going to get the, the uh, bi-monthly forecast. So nothing is changing there. The other change, though, that I will... Um, share with you is that I'm also going to discontinue my email list, right? 
Um, so if that is usually how you find out about when I post these videos or any, anything like that, um, just know that maybe you want to subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed or have a notification setting or, you know, just know that I'm still going to be uploading twice a month for the new and full moon. So, but I am going to get discontinue the email list as well. It actually costs money to do that. And I'm trying to consolidate resources and consolidate my energetic focus and resources on um, where I'm being guided. And I, and I have no doubt that many people um, are going through similar transitions right now and it's time to reorient uh, focus. So those are the main announcements. Like I said, it's really not affecting anybody who's watching this on the channel, unless you've already been a subscriber through Subscribestar. You already know that that, um, as of January 2025, that's going to be discontinued for now. So, and you know, if you feel called to donate because you are a regular viewer or whatever, you know, maybe I could get my channel monetized. I don't know. I really don't care at this point. Um, I don't do this for the money at all. Um, and, and especially now, it's not a necessity. I'm not trying to build a practice as a, for my livelihood in terms of this content. So um, I'm not really that worried about it. And in fact, now I don't have to actually play to an audience that I'm trying to build in order to, um, you know, keep a business going because I don't need it. So um, I can just say whatever the hell I want at this point, you know, within the limits of uh, YouTube. But I try not to get too specific about anything anyway and utilize the astrology as the temporal map and a primer for people's individual uh, journey. So uh, certainly there are things that are political, that are social, that are cultural, um, that we're all dealing with, that we're all interfacing with, that um, come into the astrological realm. And I do my best to make um, connections to that without being too uh, specific because it's really not about what I think it's about teaching people um, and reading the map and teaching you how to read the map for yourself so that you can utilize this tool for what it's meant to be which is the soul you know moving through incarnations and learning what our um, dharma and our karma is through the um, astrology so let's get into some solar weather and we'll come back to uh, this particular image i just wanted to show you in the actual living sky itself the full moon uranus and the pleiades because this is going to be part of the conversation today and it's not really a conversation as i'm talking at you <laughs> through this microphone but you know, you can, you, you can, we, we are having a conversation. We're having a conversation telepathically. You're listening to what I'm saying and you're processing it and it's bringing up other thoughts and then you're sharing them with other people. You are writing about them. You're thinking about them. So there is a conversation that's happening. So I just wanted to show you how linked all of these things are in the actual sky. Now, Uranus, you can't see with the naked eye. So, but if you do have a telescope, that can be helpful, but you can see the Pleiades and you definitely could see the full moon with the naked eye and just know that they're all um, coalescing together with this full moon, which is going to be on the 15th of November. So let's talk about the solar weather here for one second. I'm going to bring up uh, spaceweather.com and I just want to, because this is actually very much part of the Pleiadian conversation, I feel like it's really important that I'm drawing attention to the, uh, the nature of the Pleiadian star seeds. And I will get a little bit more into that if you're unfamiliar or if you're skeptical and you're like, what is this star seed crap? Like, I can't take it seriously. And I totally understand that, believe me. Um, and there is something to the charts um, and the connection to these actual star systems, these clusters, and how they, just like the rest of the astrology chart, is just more of a galactic focus. Anyway, so... In the last day or so, especially yesterday, like the inflammation in my body has been off the charts. And it actually hasn't been that bad over the last couple of months. This is the first time in, I'd say, two or three months that I've had this level of discomfort. Now, one thing I have noticed about me personally is that when the moon comes into Aries and it's in my second house... Um, I always have inflammation in my body, in the internal waters, right, is definitely inflamed. I've come to expect that and try to do what I can to mitigate those effects. So that was already happening. Um, now, there was a coronal hole. So let me let me scroll down and show you. Now, this is spaceweather.com. You can go look at this information for yourself. I'm not telling you anything that you can't figure out. 
there is a coronal hole, right? So there is a hole in the corona of the sun. And when that happens, uh, solar wind and plasma is like, a, it's, it connects to our magnetic field. And there's like a stream of solar wind that comes at us. Now, this is something that has hit us between yesterday and today. It has not caused a geomagnetic storm, as you can see when it says planetary K index, right? And many of you know this already, so just bear with me because I, I, it's important that we continue to not only remind ourselves and practice and repeat things, but other people may not understand this. And it's important that we do because all of this stuff still affects us down to the cellular, down to the electromagnetic level. And this is where the real battle, in my opinion, this is the real battle right here, um, is down at this level. And the more that we get kind of pulled into the things that are more on the surface, and it's not to say that the political and social and cultural aspects aren't important, but if we don't take into consideration these aspects of what's happening down to the electromagnetic level, or the cellular level, and how we're being impacted, then none of that really is going to matter. So... This coronal hole, you can see the big black spot, right? So we're getting hit with this solar wind. Now, it hasn't been super dense. The solar wind, the plasma, hasn't been super dense. And you can look at that when you, when you look at the solar wind conditions, right? When the protons per cubic centimeter are higher, then it's dense. There's more particles in the solar wind. But it's pretty fast, right? You're looking 400 kilometers per second, so it's measuring that. Now, Spaceweather.com is saying that the stream of solar wind is grazing our field. It's Now, it says it's not fast moving, but it is affecting our planet. I would beg to differ. 400 kilometers per second seems pretty fast, but I mean, I guess it's been faster. Now, what it's saying here in teaching us is that the solar wind is south pointing um, the south pointing magnetic fields in the solar wind stream. And so basically it's canceling out the north pointing magnetic field and creating uh, cracks in the magnetic field. And so when that happens, you get more particles coming in through the magnetosphere into the ionosphere and you're getting aurora. So you can see this band here when it says current auroral oval, move it over a little bit you can see that it's pretty bright and so people in Canada and the Arctic and Alaska and things like that you know got a good show in terms of the auroras now what does this have to do with uh inflammation and the Pleiadian nature well let's go back to we'll go back to this here give us something to to look at now one thing that I can't look at anymore because the public data from Tomsk University in Russia is no longer available, which is the Schumann Residence, okay? So if you, if anybody out there knows somebody who is registered with that site, um, because that's the only way you can look at it, it's not publicly available anymore. You have to be registered with that site in order to access their data. So if anybody knows somebody who has registered with that site and has, um, uh, real-time access to that listening station for the Schumann, please let me know because I really would like to keep tracking it, but I can't. But my money is on the fact that, so back up a little bit. So when you get these solar wind streams, it amplifies earthquake potential considerably, right? Because you're getting much more um, plasma and solar wind particles coming into the magnetosphere, into the ionosphere, bouncing all around. The electrical signals are going, yeah, it's got to go somewhere. It goes into the ground, it goes through um, the seismic uh, system, I guess, and earthquake potential goes up considerably when we have solar wind. Now, that in itself is not really, it can affect us, but the way that I felt yesterday was really, really intense. And I took all of my measures, and, and the reason I'm sharing this with you is because uh, just to give you an idea of like the types of things that you could do to mitigate these effects, right? So um, tons of inflammation in my body, like my joints, especially the problematic joints were definitely like on fire, but my whole body was systemically inflamed, kind of out of nowhere. My money is on a blast of the Schumann and not in a natural way, right? So you're talking about some sort of artificial intervention into the ionosphere that has an acronym that starts with an H um, and then uh, ends with a P. And oftentimes 
you'll see these blasts, right? The amplitude of the Schumann resonance gets really loud. Um, and I'm thinking, in my opinion, based on how I felt, how I used to track it in the past, based on the fact that the solar wind was coming in, based on everything else that is happening, and maybe a... Um, perhaps a motive motivated maybe there are parties that are motivated to you know cause chaos in some way um, maybe a big earthquake for instance my money is that there was an artificial amplitude amplification of the schumann and that has very negative effects because you can't get away from elf right the human brain is entrained to 7.8 hertz all over right and so when it gets really loud um, you can't just block it necessarily. It's, it's such a deep, uh, condition basically. I don't, I don't even know if you want to call it a, con it's a condition of the human brain to be entrained to that 7.8 Hertz. And so when there is a loud amplification, um, that's coming from not the planet, but from some other source, perhaps it can cause serious problems. Now, the reason I'm bringing this into the conversation about the Pleiadian star seeds is, um, because we are like sponges to electromagnetics right now. There are all kinds of wonderful, positive, beautiful aspects to being Pleiadian starseed. And I don't channel information. I don't pick up this information intuitively. I don't have people's guides talk to me about this stuff. I only look at it in the chart. So if you've had a reading with me, and so you already know this, and um, if you haven't had a reading, but you want to confirm maybe that you have this, or you're, you're curious to see how this um, factors into your larger uh, personality and your soul work, you can always do the Starseed reading or the Galactic Oversoul reading. Um, that's all on my website. So, and that's linked in the description box. However, there are lots of beautiful things about being Pleiadian Starseed, but there is some really significant blind spots that people tend to not consider. Not one of those and one of the main ones is that Pleiadian star seeds tend to be sponges of electromagnetic um, effects, right? They're, our boundaries tend to be very poor because we don't really want them. We want to be in communion with nature. We want to be in communion with each other very physically. So Pleiadian star seeds are incredible physical healers, right? People that do body work and energy work tend to be Pleiadian star seeds because of the connection. Um, we want to ground ourselves in with the earth, right? With the, with nature. Um, we are very connected to the rhythm of the natural world. So when that's disrupted artificially, say by some sort of technology, for instance, that, um, you know, is a carrier wave along the Schumann resonance, for instance, um, we definitely feel it. And there is such a necessity for Pleiadian star seeds, especially right now with this full moon coming, with all of this solar activity, Uranus involved, which has not been easy. Let's just be honest here. Uranus is constantly shifting the landscape, quite literally in Taurus. Um, and it's, and it's very electrifying. And it's not a very easy place for Pleiadian starseeds right now. Um, and it hasn't been for months and months and months because Uranus moves very slowly and it retrogrades half of the year. So it's been sitting in this area now for months and months and months. Um, and the fact that we're getting this full moon right here um, tomorrow, basically, it's just getting amplified. And so Pleiadian star seed, if you know you're Pleiadian star seed, if you suspect that you are, if you've been having a lot of issues um, physically, especially in the last day or so, even within the last week, but especially in the last day or so, um, inflammation, your joints are hurting, you have to step up your game because otherwise you just get taken out by these as these electromagnetic changes that are um, not natural. Now, some of them are natural, and that is something that the body is able to more readily deal with, right? But when it's artificial, um, it's very uh, destructive. So what did I do? So this is just what works for me. You know, I've spent 20 years in the healing arts and studying Chinese medicine, studying Ayurvedic medicine, practicing body work, doing energy work. So, and cranial, and the cranial sacral work is very 
electrical as well when you're working with the cerebral spinal fluid, right? It is the uh, fluid system for your nervous system. So what did I do? Um, and I have my hands on people all day, every day, right? Some people have had certain medical interventions. Some people haven't. And again, I have to step up my game as not only Pleiadian starseed, but a person who is a healer or a healing facilitator, I should say because the body is self-correcting. I'm not doing anything other than being present to help the body find its grounded state in order to heal itself, right? That's pretty much what Jesus was doing. Uh, now, what did I do? I got distracted. <laughs> uh, number one, baking soda bath. Making your body as alkaline as you can get it is really, really helpful, um, especially because it doesn't necessarily stop signal, but it slows it down in the body, electrical signal, because of the shift in the, um, when your body is more acidic, when your pH is lower, you have more hydrogen ions, positive ions, you wanna get more negative. So the alkaline, so baking soda bath, that's one thing. And I put some lavender and I put some frankincense to just help calm the chi, calm the nervous system, lessen the inflammation. So those are some things you can do. Um, second thing I did was that I doubled my turmeric CBD, right? Because turmeric is help with inflammation as well. The CBD helps with pain and inflammation. I did that as well. Tart cherry extract is really good for helping with inflammation. I did all of those things last night, boom, 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 and went right to bed. Um, and I felt a lot better this morning. Not 100% but much better. I was really, really struggling yesterday. And of course the moon is moving out of my second house and, and, and I'm moving out of Aries and moving into Taurus. And it's like, oh, it's such a relief. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, you got to find what works for you. But if you are a Pleiadian star seed, especially with this full moon and Uranus involved and, and the motivation to continue to destroy people and to cause chaos, because it's definitely out there just you have to step up your game. And so um, if you need resources, if you don't know what to do, um, like I said, alkaline, and I, I put them all up on my channel, all of the Defense Against the Dark Arts stuff about cymatics, about all the ways to deal with your biochemistry, the W ban, right? And the fact that that's a real issue. It's all up on this channel, so you can always go and listen to those things and get some ideas, right? But it's important that you know your own body. Okay, I'm done with the preaching to the Pleiadian star seeds, but it's important because the boundaries are really, they tend to be really not very good with Pleiadian star seeds. I'm just going to be honest, and um, that's because there is a, a, a deep soul yearning to be in communion with uh, with nature but when that when that's not always the safest thing or if it's destructive or poisonous that can be a problem so pleading star seeds also have food sensitivities like crazy um so you know the whole seed oils right cooking on teflon um you know just your water being compromised your food being compromised you know all of that stuff is going to be that much more impactful on pleading and starseed people so you have to knowing these things is more than just like I'm a starseed it's actually like okay these are the types of things that I have to be aware of because they're blind spots there are assets and there are challenges to all these starseed locations so we'll talk more about Antares when we do the new moon because that's a whole different ball game so my friends let's move on to the astrology shall we um, and because that's why we are here now there are, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, my friends, there are some pretty big heavy hitters in this next two weeks. So I'm just going to name them off. Not So we start with our full moon conjunct Uranus, which means that the sun will be opposite Uranus. So that's the other thing. Just be prepared for unexpected, like outside of the box, chain, box changes, um, especially when we talk about Scorpio and Taurus. We're talking about resources. We're talking about shared resources with Scorpio. We're talking about objective reality and shared reality when you're talking about Scorpio. So I'll go into the specifics about all of those things as we uh, as we go through the play-by-play. -play. But so we have this full moon. We have Saturn stationing direct the very same day. Now I've talked about this endlessly. Um, and this retrograde of Saturn has been absolutely brutal. It has been unyielding. But 
what it has done is forced us to reshape the mold. And when Saturn stations direct and starts moving um, forward again, and it's not ever moving backwards, it's just an illusion based on perspective. When Saturn stations direct, we're going to start pouring the concrete or whatever into that new mold. So hopefully during this retrograde, you have taken it to heart here and re you know, reshaped that mold, whatever it is, that infrastructure, that scaffolding, whatever it is with Saturn, because once it's direct, it's going to be the place where that's going to solidify, which is kind of interesting in Pisces, because there is no solidification in Pisces, but there will be aspects of institutional framework that will be solidified in this sign of um, spirit and karma. So, yeah, if, if Pisces is karma, Virgo is your dharma, right? And those that's a different conversation. But it will be an important conversation as the nodes of the moon shift into those signs. We'll talk about that with the seasonal forecast that's coming with the solstice because that's also going to be the time period roughly, roughly, um, that the nodes are going to shift out of Aries and Libra into Pisces and Virgo. So in the north node, right, the trajectory of our soul um, that direction is going to be in Pisces, right? The karma. So, uh, so Saturn stations direct Pluto is going to come into the sign of Aquarius. Okay. Um, during this next two weeks. So that's a big deal. And it's not the first time, but this is going to be a permanent placement. Now it's not going to retrograde back into Capricorn again. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure it's not. I have said that before and I was wrong, but I'm pretty sure Pluto will not come back into Capricorn for the next 200 plus years, okay? So these big institutional destructive demolition, it's it's almost over. Pluto's coming into Aquarius. We talked about Saturn stationing direct on the full moon and Mercury is going to station retrograde in Sagittarius. And it's also going to be opposite Jupiter uh, before that happens. So we'll talk about these things um, as well. So there's, uh, there's a lot of shifting. There is a lot of um, transitions that are about to happen in this next, next two weeks. I will just say, just for the sake of uh, framing this all around a larger geopolitical landscape, President Trump's midheaven, right on this full moon. I mean, Uranus is literally literally sitting on his midheaven. And I will say that he also has a 10th house natal Uranus, so as well as the sun and the north node all in Gemini. So if you think that you can pin anything down on this man, you are crazy, right? You obviously don't know astrology. Um, and many people do. And they realize that there is no way to predict what he's doing with Uranus in the 10th house in Gemini. So, however... It's all happening on his 10th house, which makes President Trump a Pleiadian star seed. Uh, and strangely enough, Biden as well, right? His son is um, in the last degrees of Scorpio. And so that also, anything in opposition to these star seed markings is also an activation of those star seed origins. So I find that really interesting too, considering the fact that there has been some sort of like weird truce that has just happened. Um, my personal opinion, I've been saying this for months now, is that uh, the Bidens totally cut a deal. They cut a deal a long time ago. Um, Maybe not that long ago, but months. It's been a couple months. Um, anyway, I don't want to get too much into those weeds. That's just my personal opinion. Um, I'm curious what people think about that. Anyway, so let's get back to the astrology, play by play. So today is the 14th. It's Thursday, and our full moon is tomorrow. So I'm trying to bring up my notes here. There they are. All right. <sighs> And Saturn stations direct. So we just talked about those things. We talked about the full moons, conjunct the Pleiades uh, in Taurus. So let's just look at tomorrow. So the next big thing. So we know that like when the moon and Uranus are together, like you just feel it, right? You feel the anticipation. You feel this kind of urge to make change. You feel this... Um, some people are going to emotionally feel anxious. Now, I will say that the moon is exalted in Taurus, right? So in tropical astrology, all of these planets in the bodies, the luminaries, 
Um, they have a place where they rule, they have a sign in a house that they rule, and then they have a sign in a house where they are either exalted or in their fall position, which is kind of like you have your rulership and your detriment, right? That axis of powerful and least powerful and then exalted and fall position, which is like the next step down. So exaltation is still very powerful but not its home territory. Well, the moon is exalted in Taurus, you know, the, um, that the emotional landscape, the waters of our, of our soul are comfortable and powerful in the natural world, right? It's like water seeping into the soil. Ooh, I love that. Um, so at least the moon will be in Taurus and there's a sense of, um, settling in, and yes, Uranus is like the lightning bolt, right? And uh, water is incredibly conductive, isn't it, right? I mean, if you, um, this is why it's important to have, um, you know, this is the cerebral spinal fluid in your in your nervous system is mostly plasma and water, right? This is the lubrication of your actual nervous system, which is an electrical system, right? So Yes, there will be some measure of anticipation, maybe some anxiety emotionally. You just can feel the change um, and it'll be very bright, very illuminating. Full moons are these moments where things come to fruition and then the last half of the cycle is basically holding that energy as the light of the moon wanes away um, as we go through the rest of the lunar cycle. So there's often um, illumination, revelation, things come to fruition, and then it's time for the harvest of this lunar cycle, which is very personal, right? You're talking about the sun and the moon, which represent in astrology the two poles of us, right? The outward expressive masculine part and the internal feeling uh, intuitive part of, of the moon. So that's, you're going to feel it. Now, it'll be much more, much more uh, dynamic, as you can see here on Saturday the 16th, when the sun and Uranus are in an exact opposition. So just to kind of give, and, and remember, Saturn station, Saturn is already stationed direct here in Pisces. So um, the mold will have been cast at this point, right? Now, Sun opposite Uranus gives an urge to try new and exciting things, um, seeking freedom to do things your way. I do feel like that there will be kind of like, oh, something's going to change. And then an opportunity to make a very swift adjustment, right? And yes, a struggle for independence can relate to an effort to explore and express your individual and personality. I think that there will be kind of this moment of, of, making a swift adjustment to a new situation, tuning into its requirements. And I do feel like the full moon is going to be the opportunity to know exactly what requirements we have to tune into. It'll be very bright and obvious and maybe not what we were expecting, um, but certainly will trigger this freedom and this independence because Uranus definitely represents that as well as the ruling planet of the sign of Aquarius, which again, Pluto's going to come into Aquarius this next two weeks. So you may anticipate something new on the horizon. Um, knowing where Taurus and Scorpio are in your charts is probably an important thing to know. Sudden changes, unexpected encounters, and events may leave you feeling unsettled and anxious. So we do know that like with the moon here and this opposition with the sun and Uranus, there's a lot of that going around and there already is, right? People are on the spectrum from total elation to total hopelessness. And the expression of that, that we have the ability because of the internet to interface with is, um, it's just across the board. So there's a lot more of this coming with this full moon. It's just gonna reach a fever pitch, basically. Learning to adapt to change will help you feel less, less disconnected. I think the adaption and the adjustment and tuning into the requirements that are nest, you know, in order to make these adjustments is going to be really important and it's going to kind of be the theme of this full moon, in my opinion. So 
keeping open mind, right? Learning to adapt to change. And, and there may be exciting opportunities, right? It's not all crazy. Um, exciting opportunities may arise from these changes that offer a better way forward. So that's the thing about keeping an open mind. And this is one of the things that I've um, suggested to people that maybe are on the side of the spectrum of being um anxious and upset and feeling hopeless and lost with what's been happening um, in the last like two weeks especially and certainly even longer but it's 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 really concentrated right now which is you know learn to make the adjustment right see the opportunity in this situation whether it's an opportunity to practice grounding yourself and not being completely taken over by the things that are happening outside of you if there is a shift that is allowing you to see a new way that you never really thought that was possible before there's a lot of opportunity here and yeah it's you know people are going to feel more anxious and struggle um and seeking freedom but there could be some really exciting opportunities. And when we're talking, again, Taurus and Scorpio is about resource, right? Objective, inherent resource of Taurus, you know, what is, and shared resource, which is Scorpio. What can we do together? And remember what the new moon was in Scorpio, the fellowship supper, right? The comrades coming together and... And, and coming together with a shared experience, right? That's where we started here. And yes, maybe... It's not exactly the role that you thought you were going to play, but it's the role that spirit has already set up for you and us. So maybe it's about making the shift. And when I say spirit, I'm not saying that we're like subject to fate, like our, our higher self is involved in this process. So maybe making those adjustments um, in real time with our personalities might be part of the work here. It would be best if you didn't resist the urge for the new and unusual, right? Um, because this, it's very spontaneous energy with sun opposite Uranus. Now remember Uranus is still retrograde, so it's not fully expressed. There's, there's the element of it being more internalized, being uh, something that we're going back over, something that we're experiencing in, you know, internally or not fully expressed. You know, you could, it could be more destructive than it needs to be if you're putting up the res more resistance, right? So, and people, you know, odd behaviors, radical about face and someone close to you may cause anxiety. Boy, there is a lot of that happening. Arguments and separation may result from impatience or unwillingness to adapt. And you're going to see it, right? You're going to see, and maybe you're already experiencing it. Um, maybe you're feeling it within yourself, like this kind of like, I can't make, I can't, I can't, I'm unwilling, or I'm too impatient. And you're feeling that resistance. Believe me, the sun opposite Uranus is going to do it whether you like it or not. So it's best not to resist the change and to be open-minded, to be flexible, to know that things might come out that you didn't expect, but this is the perfect opportunity to make those adjustments, okay? So that's this coming weekend, yay! Um, you can also see that Venus is now in Capricorn. Um, I certainly, I personally really appreciate this placement. It's very mature. It's got this grandmother, wise woman energy, um, older, more established, wiser um, grandmother energy that comes in and just, you know, establishes the... Um, and, and values, truly, not just the personal sense of comfort and security, but the institutional whole. So Capricorn or the 10th house, right? This is where our power is released. It's the ecosystem as a whole. So this can mean lots of different things, right? It can mean an entire industry. It can mean an economy. It can mean a government. It can mean an extended family. It's really just, you know, it's the ecosystem. It's the entire forest, right, of Capricorn. Venus here as the divine feminine in this area is mature um, and very grounded, I think, and very business oriented. So the fact that there's this T-square with the nodes of the moon, right, which is the soul's trajectory, where we're coming out of, where we're going, um, I think this is a really interesting, interesting timing, especially because... Uh, she, in particular, is really bringing our attention back to um, a need to really account for everything before we cross a threshold. Now, a North Node or, or Rahu 
the ascending node in Aries, and it's been this way for like, you know, the last year plus, you know, is really pulling us in the direction of our own subjective experience, you know, of our own sovereignty, of freedom as an individual soul and being, right? And these are all important things. And I personally have been really uh, embracing this over the last year because um, this is the trajectory at a soul level. We're being pulled in this direction. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's just this T-square is going to bring up the necessity of, you know, it's not just about us all the time. And that does eventually lead back up to the top of the chart, the, the zenith of Capricorn, right? The release of our power, the divine matrix in and of itself. And there are there's a necessity here. There is a need to really tap in in our feels and in our senses and in our relationships to um, making sure that everything is accounted for before we move forward. Okay. Um, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. And then of course, whenever you have a T square, you want to look at the ghost point that's not there, but fills in like the full square, the grand square, which is down in cancer, right? Uh, six degrees cancer is, you know, birds feathering the nest, right? So there is a need to put our personal energy into creating the space in which something new can grow, right? And yes, at soul level, we're like, yes, I'm ready to, I'm ready to, you know, really be stable in my personhood, right? In my sovereignty and in my individuality. So, but there are other aspects here that are um, really drawing our attention, which is kind of interesting with the sun opposite Uranus because it's going to be like, whoa, there's some like swift changes. And Venus and Capricorn is going to be like, okay, take a deep breath, put your feet on the ground, make sure that everything is accounted for before you cross the threshold, right? Don't go freaking out. Um, you know, just because you feel the winds of change, right? There's, there's a need to not like destroy that which is valuable. And that's relationships, that's resources, that's projects, all of those things that lead to a healthy ecosystem in, you know, whatever, whatever system you're talking about in your own personal life. Okay. So that's the weekend, Right. So it's going to be pretty it's going to be pretty outrageous and there's going to be a lot of unexpected things and anxiety and people just like ah, an excitement. And then the Venus in Capricorn in this T-square is going to be like, just slow your roll, lean into where it's uncomfortable, realize the only way out is through. But sometimes you got to take a you got to take a pause before you cross that threshold. OK, you don't want to destroy things that matter to you before you move forward. OK, and some people are. And they will have to live with the karma of those decisions, just like we have to do that with everything, right? So we come into Monday, which is the 18th, and we're going to see um, this is where the Mercury opposite Jupiter uh, transit. Now, they are in each other's. There's a mutual reception happening here because these two are in each other's. They're in their detriment, which means they are in the sign that the opposite planet is the ruler of, okay? So this is actually really helpful. Now, when Mercury is opposite Jupiter, it brings big ideas, grand plans. You can feel very optimistic and friendly. This is like one of those transits that the opposition actually really works in our favor in terms of bringing ideas together into a conclusion or into uh, an understanding or a synthesis, right? Um, narrow your view here because Mercury in Sagittarius is, is wanting, you know, can kind of get lost in, in the big picture here because it really wants to, you know, focus on the ideas. So maybe we have to narrow our view and, and focus on something, you know, instead of the grand plan, maybe focusing a little bit more on, you know, what's right in front of us, you know, and it's easy to skip over the details in a transit like this or believe you can handle more than you can. So go back to that Venus in a T-square to the nodes and remember to slow your roll a little bit, especially when it comes to important decisions or business negotiations, it might be worth it to get some professional advice. Hmm. The fortunate nature of Jupiter, even in its retrograde, even in, in Gemini, can bring many opportunities, but you don't want to be overconfident. You don't want to necessarily, and, and people are feeling like they need to um, seek safer areas. People are legitimately um, very fearful and very um, anxious about what to expect. 
again, this is a good opportunity to kind of focus in, slow the roll here, not get too caught up in all in that. And because if you get too overconfident pushing forward, you could lead to, it could lead to loss, right? Or embarrassment or whatever. So this is a great opportunity to question your plans, your ideas, and your beliefs. Um, and maybe people will challenge you, forcing you to examine those weak spots. I don't think that's a terrible thing. And maybe you find yourself actually being on the other end of that, you know, like questioning people, getting them to, um, you know, come to their own conclusions without telling them what to think. You know, I actually had an experience like that just this week um, where, you knew someone was going to come to that conclusion on their own um, and you had to just kind of let them and be, you know, compassionate about it. And but also not necessarily um, what's the word I'm looking for? You don't want to enable the negative aspect. And they did. They totally came to it on their own. Um, so your beliefs and opinions may be controversial if they're too just too extreme with Mercury opposite Jupiter. It pulls you back into balance between your thoughts and your beliefs. And I do feel like the mutual reception of Mercury and Jupiter in their opposite signs is going to help with this a lot to, again, kind of slow your roll, bring back um, those big plans and those grand ideas into, and, and there's nothing wrong with feeling optimistic about it and to um, have this these sense of big ideas and grand plans, but you just want to bring it back into something that's workable. And maybe you do have to give yourself the opportunity to question some things. Now, on top of that is the sun in a trine to Neptune as well. So um, again, this is going to be right on Joe Biden's natal sun, which is 28 degrees Scorpio. Um, and it's going to be in a trine to Neptune, which increases the sensitivity to the environment around you, right? you gain a more profound and broader understanding of your place in the world. So this along with um, this Mercury opposite Jupiter on Monday, I think is going to be very important because I think that that broader understanding of your place in the world and realizing that your goals and dreams are important and they are able to be manifested. They absolutely are. Um, it also allows us when the sun is in a trine to Neptune to stay true to our spiritual ideals um, and, and really benefit from a spiritual outlook. Now, Neptune being retrograde, and in its home sign of Pisces, you know, you can't escape the fullness of that situation for better or for worse, right? And so the fog is clear and you see things for what they are um, and you're experiencing them. And, and a lot of people are really struggling still with this. So your path to success can be helped by uplifting self-belief um, and even intuitive impressions with the sun, especially in water signs like this. And, you know, and again, star sea markings, 26, 27, 28 degrees. So this is very galactic too. That's going to bring people into um, much more profound understanding of our place in the world, right? And increasing the sensitivity to the environment and empathy for other people, right? So you may find yourself becoming more empathic and empathetic towards people who are still struggling right now. Um, and then on the 19th is when Pluto enters Aquarius and on the 21st is when the sun enters Sagittarius. Okay. So, and they're going to come into a sextile in this, um, configuration when, let's see here. Yep. So Pluto comes in, sun comes into Sagittarius. These two come into a sextile in this position and people become very determined. They become very purposeful. Um, you can become very obsessive or compulsive when, um, with this, but it also, you can harness that energy and put it towards completing a difficult task. So, um, I do anticipate that people really are going to like feel the change. They're going to make a, a swift adjustments. They're going to tune into the requirements of a new situation and they're going to start harnessing those, that determination and purpose to complete something very difficult, sun, sextile, Pluto, and especially anything that is broken down or is no longer helpful in your life, right? A bad habit, a messy room, whatever. These are just examples, right? And so sun, sextile, Pluto really increases your power. And it's such a huge benefit if you don't abuse it. Um, 
the sun at zero degrees Sagittarius, Alpha Centauri. Uh, Alpha Centauri star, star seeds tend to be very, um, they tend to be uh, very giving, um, very charitable, and self-sacrificing, and not in a way where they're giving of themselves. It is more of tapped into um, the wellspring of spirit. So they're not giving of themselves. They are just uh, channeling or a medium for what is infinite um resource coming through and so in a sextile pluto like this boy if you can if you can harness this power it is incredible um to really help people really help yourself and um deepen your interest in solving mysteries getting to the bottom of things especially when it comes to pluto in aquarius because you're talking about civilization you're talking about the social consciousness as a whole right moving out of the uh, material institutions into the into the human spirit right which aquarius represents and of course you know we're closer to the age of aquarius than we're than not right so this is huge. Now, the third quarter moon is on, what is that, on the, this day as well, because as you can see, the moon is going to come into Virgo. Speaking of Dharma, <laughs> so uh, this third quarter moon is always a crisis in consciousness, right? The All of the idols are being stripped down. To, we're preparing for the next lunar cycle, which is the next seed of intention. So things are really breaking down. They're stripping away down to their essence and um, always a crisis in consciousness, right? And an ideological crisis, basically. So when you have the square with the sun and uh, the moon and these mutable signs, right? I just, I just feel like that along with Venus coming into a sextile to Saturn at the same time, it increases your need for companionship. Um, and I do feel like that this type of, this, this type of, um, transit along with the square, I think is really going to set us up for finding maybe a new teacher or a mentor, right? Um, oftentimes with Venus sextile Saturn, um, you know, increases your need for companionship and you want to feel loved and you want to feel valued. But considering that Venus is in Capricorn, right, the rule, the sign of Saturn, Saturn's in Pisces, right, of spirit. And then you have this square with um, the moon in Virgo, which again is our Dharma, right, our service. Um, and the sun in Sagittarius, which is very much about the, the, the meaning and the purpose of relationship. I just feel like that these two days are really, you know, as we go through all this tumultuous kind of adjustment period and like rethinking things and um, tapping into the broader perspective of what we're doing here, these transits, then this, this particular square, I think is going to really kind of set us up for finding new relationships, um, teacher student type of relationships, right? Long-term commitments, of any type, right? Practical, common sense types of things, um, especially applying to recent difficulties. Resolutions can be found and there can be mutual understanding. This is Venus sextile Saturn, right? Doing business is favored, right? Um, but it's going to be the moon and the sun in that square. I think that's really going to be the troubling, you know, the sticking point of just like, oh my God, like I feel my dharma and I understand emotionally this kind of need to suffer because it's only, the, you know, the, the blood of the heart needs to wash the third eye, if that makes sense. There is a need for suffering in order to understand truly what compassion really feels like and the purpose of that. And I, and I think that through that, it's going to then... Set, like I said, set us up for new relationships, um, new relationships in, in a larger context with Venus sextile Saturn. Now the 25th is when Mercury stations retrograde. I do think that we're going to see. Okay. So 23 degrees Sagittarius is about immigrants coming into um, a country and they fulfill the requirements of entrance into the new country. So the idea here is that we are 
maintaining our integrity, but also consciously accepting the new ways. Now, this is where Mercury is going to station retrograde, okay? So it's already at its detriment in Sagittarius, but at least coming into the retrograde, it's going to kind of, you know, give us an opportunity to reassess what those requirements are, how we can maintain our personal integrity as we accept the new, consciously accept the new ways of, of the territory that we're coming into that we're making a choice to come into so we have some time now with this retrograde to figure you know to reassess what those things are and to maybe do some inner work about how do I maintain my integrity on the inside while also um, making changes to coincide with the new territory that I'm going in. So this is going to, you know, Mercury retrogrades last about three weeks. So there'll be some time to uh, figure that out. And, you know, the big one leading up to the new moon. So now we're getting into the weekend before Thanksgiving, right? So here in the U.S. and the you can see here that Mars is coming into aspect with the nodes of the moon. It's coming very close to stationing retrograde, right? So that means that it will come into aspect with the nodes again. It will come into opposition again um, with, with Pluto, actually two more times. So be ready for that. But before any of that happens, the sun and Mars will come into a trine. And in fact, that is going to create a kite with the nodes of the moon. So kites um, are awesome. I love kites in astrology because the tension of the opposition is a necessity for the kite to fly. And then everything else around it is, as you can see, blue, which means it's beneficial, it's harmonious, it's foundational. Um, it is transformational as well, but there's not tension and friction that creates that. There's actual harmony here. Um, and the kite flies. It needs the opposition of the soul uh, trajectory in this case, because you're talking about the nodes of the moon. So I, um, the, the Mars trine the sun is the big one that I'm seeing here. And uh, I actually, here, I wanna, whoops, I wanna look up. And you can do this too, right? You just type in, just to open, move tab to new window. You just type in sun, trine, Mars, transit into your search engine and you can find whatever you want here. Um, this is also my birthday, by the way. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about this actually. Uh, the 27th is when it's exact, so let's go forward to there so you can see it. Oh, there we go. There we go. So Sun, Trine, Mars, it is a kite as well. They don't have it on here, like the opposition with the nodes is not drawn on this chart, but it's there. So Sun, Trine, Mars, Transit, it boosts your self-confidence, your enthusiasm. This is a great time to start new projects. You feel strong, courageous. This is coming from astrologyking.com, by the way. Use your initiative to get the ball rolling, tackle demanding tasks. This is gonna be really important uh, because Mars is about to station retrograde here. Um, you can understand what motivates you now due to a conscious awareness of your primal desires, right? So everything leading up to this point feels like an opportunity to really understand your, our own motivations about what we're doing and why we're doing it and possibly, you know, considering what might be underlying intrusions about our motivations that go into, um, you know, ways of control. Uh, that's something to consider as well. But this this is a great transit. You're very confident. Um, you can really get stuff done. You have a strong urge to take action under this transit. And of course, Mars and Leo is very much, we're projecting the self through our expression. And the sun in Sagittarius, especially six degrees Sagittarius, this is about group skills. This is about kind of you're taking your own personal expression and putting it towards, you know, the the group activity right the the game that we're playing right it's uh 
pretty amazing. And you can see that it's all wrapped up too in the nodes of, of the moon and this kite. And so, yeah, there's a tension between where we've been and where we're going, right? The, the dragon of our soul's trajectory right now. But without that tension, this kite can't fly. And again, knowing where Leo is, knowing where Sagittarius is, knowing what else is going on in your chart is very important here. And of course, you know, Venus is going to square Chiron. <sighs> And there are things happening in the background that I think are important to consider with this square. And it's just going to bring up, like, am I doing enough? Am I helping enough people? Do I have what it takes to really offer people what they need? And sometimes um, just being part of uh, the choir in the background is truly enough to bring the congregation to a point of communion right and um i think that that's gonna you know it's gonna bring that up too with the square with chiron but i love this kite i really do i think this is great uh, especially moving into uh the next lunar cycle which is the sun and the moon conjunct in sagittarius conjunct antari so we'll talk all about that um on the next uh forecast so my friends i'm gonna leave it there for today time to move on to other things pleiadian star seeds you better be taking care of yourself because um i mean we're all affected but this full moon it's gonna be and uh it's going to be very, it's very palpable already. And so it's just very important that those boundaries are taken seriously and protected. Not close yourself off necessarily, but know that you are affected by the changes that happen at the fundamentally, you know, physical and energetic level, electromagnetically. So um, if you're, if you are interested in a reading or an energy work session, you can go to my website, it's linked in the description box below, um, and stay tuned for the new moon forecast. That's all I got for you guys today. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate all of you so very much. It's been a wonderful journey. I'm glad that it's continuing going on a different pathway now, and I look forward to your comments and sharing, subscribing, liking this video, you know the drill, um, and I'll see you next time. Ciao for now. Take care, everyone. Have a great Thanksgiving. I won't see you until then, so um, I hope it is... I hope it is full of thanksgiving and gratitude for the blessings that we all have. So take care, everyone. Bye.